Welcome to the One Church Podcast. Our Joy to the World series will encourage, challenge, and inspire you to be the agents of joy in our world. Did you know the popular song sung at Christmas time, Joy to the World, was not written about the birth of Christ, but the return of Christ. As we wait for the coming of Jesus, let's reflect on why and how we can be joyful in this world. Please stay tuned as we prepare to delve into this week's message. Would you turn with me to the book of James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. If you have your Bible, just turn it with me. If you, happen, don't, if you don't happen to have one, uh, the scripture will be on the screen for you. Amen. James chapter, thank you. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. I'm going to read, uh, and the screen is going to show the NIV, but I will also follow with the reading from the New Living Translation as well. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it reads like this. Consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and let perseverance finish its work, let it finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Amen. The New Living Translation, I just want to read it for another perspective. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, Consider it an opportunity for great joy. Someone shout great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Amen and amen. Father God, Lord, I come before you along with each and every one of your children. Lord, we together come and humble ourselves before your word. Lord, I just happen to be the messenger here today. But God, you bring the message through the Holy Spirit, power and anointing. Lord, I pray, oh God, that the hearts of the people would be ministered to because you know what they're going through. I don't. Many don't. But you know what we're all going through. What we're feeling, what we're thinking, what we're sensing. What we're experiencing in our lives. And even in the good seasons, in the good days, but also in the hard times, the trials, the tribulations the suffering, and even in the hard seasons, that we can still have joy in the Lord. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us. I commit myself into your mighty hands. Minister to our people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen Amen and amen. Would you take a moment before you sit, say hello to three people. Three people you didn't come here with and you haven't seen. Three people, three people. Say hello, get out of your seats if you need to. Say welcome to one church. Welcome to one church. Praise the Lord. Good to see all your faces, new faces, old faces, familiar faces. Amen. Praise the Lord. This week, 10 years ago, um, was a time that we didn't plan for or expect as a family. This week, 10 years ago, uh, we lost our paternal grandmother. My dad's mom, who passed away 10 years ago this week. A year or so later, or later, two years later, Kayla was about maybe two or three. We would drive by the nearby hospital, Franklin Hospital over here. And she would just look over and just in her little kid understanding say, is that where we, in our language or culture, Amichi, your grandma, um, went to sleep or left? And we were like, whoa, she understood that. At that young age. And it reminded me, the calendar can tell us what we need to think. The calendar can tell us what we need to be doing. Putting up decorations and festive atmospheres and joyful songs. And the calendar can tell us a lot of things. But life doesn't go according to the calendar. Life will still happen when God determines life will happen. 
So it would have been, a, it was Christmas season. But in our home family, not just us, many of you probably had those moments. And many of you are going through Thanksgiving and Christmas when the world is saying joy to the world as we are in a series, joy to the world. But what do you do when it's hard to be joyful in a hard season? What do you do when it's hard to be joyful or it, it, it's impossible or it, it, I can't make it or I can't do it. I, I, I'm going through loneliness or I'm going through lack or I'm going through this uh, issue or this experience. I'm going through this crisis. How many of you have ever or heard of someone or maybe you've experienced it, you've lost a job in the middle of the holidays? You've come across a health report or a crisis or dealing with something in the middle of the holidays or at any point. When it's supposed to be a festive atmosphere, you are really going through life and outside may tell you to be happy, but inside is really bringing you down. Can anyone relate to that? Today I want to just bring, I know last week we started our series Joy to the Worlds declaring I'm so glad. Anyone remember I'm so glad? I'm so glad. But today I want to bring this message to uh, encourage, but also maybe teach and remind us that there can be joy in the hard seasons. There can be joy in the hard seasons. In this verse that we read, if we bring our attention there, it says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, or consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. In the New Living Translation, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, is it did we read the scripture? We read the scripture? You heard the scripture? Did it say if? Or did it say when? What did it say? Let's look at the word. What did it say? Consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials. So it's not a question of if you will face trials, but it's just a matter of when we will face trials. So we will face trials. It isn't easy to go through these seasons with joy, but it is possible. Someone say it's possible. It's possible. I read a quote by a, a woman by the name of Lori Schumacher, and she said, it, walking as a follower of Christ doesn't make it always easy to find joy in difficult seasons, but it does make it possible. It doesn't always find, make it easy, but it can be possible. Because we have joy, the joy of the Lord doesn't remove our trials, doesn't discount it or disqualify us or even negate our trials or doesn't take away our struggles and our storms. We still have our struggles and our storms. But God says, I can still give you joy in the middle of it. Joy doesn't remove it. But in Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10, it says, do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen? It's not my own efforts. It's not the, it's not the, uh, the songs that I sing or it's not the, the, the books that I read or it's not all of these efforts that I'll put to make myself feel happy. It's not about us feeling happy, but it's about us receiving the joy of the Lord. Life will give us sorrow. Life will give us trials. Life will give us hard seasons, but the Lord will give us joy. Amen? In the Psalms, it tells us, rejoice in the Lord. In Psalms 5, verse 11. In Psalms 9, verse 14, it says, rejoice in God's salvation. Rejoice in God's strength. In Psalms 21, verse 1. It, rejoice in his love. In Psalms 31. Rejoice in his promises. In Psalms 119. But not just in the Psalms of the Old Testament. Even when we come to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, who we were just reading one of his letters and studying one of his letters over the past three months. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Rejoice when others rejoice and are honored. In Romans chapter 12. Rejoice when others rejoice. Even when we are going through a hard season. If we see our brothers and sisters have a reason to rejoice. Maybe if we would rejoice with others. Maybe we would get back a little bit of our own joy. Amen. What you give you will get. Rejoice with others. Rejoice with the truth in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Rejoice when Christ is preached. But also Matthew and Luke in the gospels. They instructed us to rejoice when we are persecuted for Christ's sakes. We have not faced and we don't know what persecution is, folks. We think because of a church calendar, that's a hard season. Because of this thing or that thing, oh, we're going into a hard season. 
We think, oh, we're serving every week or every day. This is a hard season. No. Persecution, we have to go to other lands and nations to really understand what persecution is. Persecution, he says, Matthew and Luke says, for Christ's sakes, rejoice, for we are persecuted for Christ. But also we can rejoice because our names are written in heaven. Amen? If your names are written in heaven, you can rejoice. Can we rejoice because our names are simply written in heaven? If no one else knows our name here, if no one will know our names. This past Friday, we studied from Romans 15 and 16. And Romans 16 had a, a, a list of names. And one of our dear sisters messaged me last night. And I think they went back and studied and counted through it all. And she gave me a count of names and churches and households and families. But there were people there without names as well. You have to understand that even if people remember our names and know our names, if God knows our name and our names are written in the book of life in heaven, that is the greatest and maybe the most important and the only place our name should be written because anywhere on earth it will, can be written and be taken off and deleted. But I know that if our names are written in the book of life and we live according to the word, we can rejoice for we are written in heaven. Amen? Amen? Peter told us to rejoice if we participate in Christ's sufferings. And I simply want to say this. It's easy to rejoice in the good times. We can be joyful in the good times. But I want to just share with you. Rejoice in the good times. Rejoice in the bad times. And rejoice at all times. Rejoice in the good times. Rejoice in the bad times. And rejoice at all times. There's so many examples in the Bible that we can look at from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But one that probably jumps off uh, the pages in the Bible or comes to mind right quickly is the person of Job. The person of Job. He had everything given to him. He had everything. He had a family. He had health. He had wealth. He had possessions. He had a job. He had a career. He had everything. But one by one, he lost everything. But in Job chapter 1, verse 21, it says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job is just one of many examples where he had gone through something. Imagine we went through that. Imagine we went through the life of Job or the experiences of Job where his family, he lost all of his children. He lost all of his children, not one, he lost all of them. He lost all of his home, his wealth and possession. He lost everything. All he had was a complaining wife left. And even her, she asked him, why don't you just give up on God? He said, No. The Lord gave and the Lord take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God. I was trying to imagine if he touched one area of my life, would I still be saying blessed be the name of the Lord our God? There was a season when the kids were younger. There was a, it was probably winter season and it was, you know, all like just like that now. Everyone's getting sick. Anyone sick here? Don't raise your hands. Everyone's sick or at home sick, watching. We're praying for everyone. Thank God those that are being healed and coming back as well. But th there was a season when it felt like one after the other, each kid is like nonstop. And I was getting frustrated. I was getting annoyed. And I truly want to tell you, I was not blessing the name of the Lord, my, my God, at that time. It, just because they got sick constantly over and over. And I kept saying... God, is, is this some virus or is this something spiritual? Is this something going on? I even asked myself that and shared it out loud probably. I'm like, what is going on here? I still don't know the answer to that. And we may feel like that at some times, but I was just reflecting on my, my own experience. I, they just got sick for an extended period of time and I got frustrated. But Job lost their, his kids. And he said, blessed be the name of the Lord our God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 9, I just want to give you the scripture because I think the scriptures will hold us through our hard seasons. Amen? The scriptures will keep us in our hard seasons. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith, someone say your faith. 
your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Keep reading. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Even, wh- even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Amen? Amen. What a beautiful word. It is your faith that God is trying to strengthen. But there's a goal for your faith, for the salvation of our souls. It is not for a good, feel-good life on this earth, but it's for the salvation of our souls for heaven. With those examples and that encouragement, I just want to share with you. You may be asking, Pastor C, how can I be joyful? Or why, can't, why should I be joyful in my hard seasons? Why should I be joyful in my hard seasons? I want to share with you four reasons why quickly. And then we'll spend some time in prayer. Number one is this. God is in control. I can be joyful in the hard seasons because God is in control. Amen? He is a sovereign God. He is on the throne. And I want to share with you, we are coming into a season, not just in, on the calendar, but we're coming into a season of life. We're coming to a season in this nation that you're going to have to remember that God is in control. He is sovereign. Regardless of what happens in the holiday season, regardless of what happened in the past, regardless of what could be projected and predicted to happen in 2024, especially around this nation with the election year, I want to tell you, you can vote for whoever you need to vote for. I'm telling you right now, God is still sitting on the throne. So be careful as a church what we fall into, what we follow, and be careful because we are not glorifying people, platforms, ideas, concepts, theologies, anything. We need to remember that God is still in control. We may go through a hard season personally as a family or as a church or even as a nation, but you and I, whenever we go through the hard seasons, I have a reason to be joyful because I know God is still sovereign. He is in control. Amen? Maybe someone's going through a breakup. Maybe someone's going through a marital strife. Maybe you, you, you're thinking of making a move or maybe you lost your job or you have a feeling something's about to come down. Maybe it's a health crisis that you're going through. Maybe it's a, uh, it's a financial crisis that you're facing. Whatever is, going ha- what is it, whatever is going on, and whatever you sense, you have to realize God is in control. Number two, it's not that ju- just God is in control, but God is good. Second reason we can be joyful in a hard season is that God is good. Come on, someone say that to yourself. All right, he's good. Okay. Uh, like, no, really, God is good? Yeah? Is he? All the time? At 11.22 in Elmont, God is good? Can we say that if we mean it? God is good. He's good. Say that to yourself. Don't look at me. Close your eyes. Close your eyes and say it to yourself. God is good. God is good. You know what you're going through, but God is good. Because Romans 8, 28 says what? And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. He works it all out for good. So God is good. God is good. God is good. That's why I can be joyful. Yes, I'm going through a hard season, but I know God is good. He was good for me yesterday. He can be good for me tomorrow as well. He's good. Third reason, if you're taking notes, I encourage you to, God can be trusted. God can be trusted. Many of us have trust issues. We have trust issues. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Trust in the Lord. God can be trusted, folks. 
even looking back at the life of Job, Job chapter 2, verse 10, it says, shall we accept only the good from God and not trouble? Can we see the hard seasons as maybe an opportunity? Because James chapter 1, verse 2 said, see it as an opportunity for joy when you face trials. Shall we accept only the good? We only want the good. We don't want the bad. But I believe we grow in the valley. We grow in the hard season. And we'll see that in a few moments. We grow through the hard seasons of life. We get stronger. We get wiser. We get more mature in Christ through the hard seasons of life. I'm grateful for the youthful energy that... As a young person, you can have. But also, if we pair that up with wisdom and experience from those that have gone through some hard seasons, that's a powerful combination. Amen? If we have the energy of, the, of a next generation and the wisdom of the now and the ne- a past generation, what a powerful and a beautiful combination that we can move ahead with energy, but also with wisdom. God can be trusted. Joyce Meyer wrote in her book, if you want to have joy, you must stop trying to figure everything out. You must stop rolling your problems around in your mind. You have to quit anxiously searching for an answer to your situation, trying to find out what you should do about it. Is that speaking to anyone? We reason and try to figure things out asking, why God, why, and when God, when? We want to know the answer to our situations So we won't have to trust God. That was powerful when I read that. We want to know the answer to our situations. Why? So that we won't have to trust God. Turn out the way we want them to. This is in her book. When we ask those two questions, why God, why, when God, when, it can keep us from enjoying the lives Jesus died to give us. I'm quoting here. Many times we don't understand what God is doing, but that's where trust comes in. But that's where trust comes in. We don't need to know what God is doing. Hey, how about this? Folks, we're his children. Sometimes our girls will ask us some things and some things we can't tell them. They won't understand it at their level right now. They may not understand it, and it doesn't apply to them right now. But there are things that Sharon Sharon and I will think about, and this is for all of us. Isn't it true? There are things that when we are children in the Lord, there are things that he won't always tell us. But he will allow us to go through it, and he will reveal himself through it and allow us to see him through that situation. He won't tell us what we're going through, but we're going to just have to go through it. He'll say, look what I did for you. Look how how I showed up for you. So I want to tell us we won't always know and we don't need to know what we're going through and we don't need to know why we're going through it what is he going to do or when is he going to do it we just need to know that he is what he is with us he is with us god is working in your life right now in ways you don't see he's a way maker isn't he he's a way maker god can be trusted folks god can be trusted. When we have uh, mess ups and failures and inadequacies and uh, all the issues of life, if we really boil it down, it's because of our failures, because of our inadequacies, because of our mistakes. And we sometimes tend to relate our issues and connect it and project it onto God. Amen? We connect our issues. And project it onto God saying, hey, uh, because of these things and inadequacies and failures, um, uh, people can't be trusted. So then if people can't be trusted who I can't see, how can I trust a God that I can't see? But I would testify God can be trusted. I can stand here today and say God can be trusted. That's our story. That's my story. God can be trusted. I may not know all the details, but God is working it all out. God can be trusted. The fourth reason we can be joyful in hard seasons is this. I think we sang the song last week, God won't fail. God won't fail. 
He cannot fail, folks. Because it's not about we lost something or we went through a bad situation or what it feels like what's bad for us or suffering for us. No, in God's eyes, it's not about bad and good. It's about there's purpose in everything. It's not about gains and losses in God's eyes. He said, I got a purpose for this. I got a reason for this. We see it from our um, earthly perspective, but God sees it from a whole other angle, whole other view, and he's saying, I'm going to use this trial. I'm going to use this loss. I'm going to use this pain. I'm going to use this crisis. I'm going to use all of this for my good and my glory. We have to come to the point and realize, hey, in the hard seasons, God will not fail me now. He has not failed me before, and he won't fail me now. He has not failed. Is there anyone here that can testify at the end of 2023? He has not failed me yet. Correction. Word usage. It's not that he has not failed me yet, which implies that he can fail me in the future. Pay attention. He's not failed me yet, meaning there's a slight opportunity. Maybe the door is left a little open for a little failure from God. No, no, no. It's not that he has not failed me yet. He has not failed me. There's no yet because he will never fail. He will never fail. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I know you and I are going through and will go through some hard seasons. I'm telling you right now, we will, if you have not gone through, it, gone, through it, go, gone through it yet, you will go through some hard seasons. But I'm telling you right now, in the little life that I've lived, that even whatever you go through, God will keep be with you. God will keep you. It may not feel good. It may not sound good. It may not look good. But God is good, and he will not fail you. He will not fail you. He will not fail you. And when he doesn't, testify of what he has done. Tell your children. Tell your home. Tell those people that God has placed in your life. God has not failed me. God will not fail me. Hallelujah. We praise you, Jesus. God is in control. Someone say, out, God is in control. God is good. God is good. God is good. God can be trusted, and God will not fail. Hallelujah. We're going through some hard seasons. We've gone through some hard seasons. Even this past week or the past couple of weeks, I, we've received a couple of testimonies that we've been praying for specifically uh, at a Monday night prayer. I'm even thankful for Monday night prayer. Amen. Monday night prayer, we heard some powerful testimonies or prayer requests, and we've been praying for it. And in the past couple of weeks, I just want to highlight a couple of them. One of the dear sisters asked for prayer for her child, her adult child, and saying, she's a little, she's far away from me. There's not been any communication for a while. She's with some other people. She's okay, but, you know, as a mother, as, you know, she's, I just want to be with her. I want her to be with me. I want to hear from her. Just this past week or the past week and a half ago, she said that she told us, hey, the daughter reached out or she was able to talk to her, connect with her, and God will and connect with her soon and see her again and spend time with her. God is a prayer answering God. He won't fail. They're sitting here. Can we just praise God? He can be trusted. Pray. 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 Put it in God's hand. Take it out of our hands and put it in God's hand and see what the Lord will do. Another dear sister shared for prayer for a, a legal matter that she was going through. It's been going on for months, and there was no resolution, and there was some stress around it, and there, there would be some hard consequences if things went a certain way. But she called me the day before the uh, set court date. She, on the phone, was so just joyful. And she, I was like, what happened? She just said, I got word and news and even I, I got news in, in writing and I got communication that they're not proceeding with anything with the case. And they're going to drop it and they're going to clear my name. I, I asked her, can, can we share that? And she said, not yet. I, got, I still got, they tell, told me I got to still go to the court date, which is the day after. And she went. And after she went, 
She texted right away after the case and after everything that needed to happen, the proceedings, and it was confirmed. Everything was dropped. Everything was dismissed. Everything was cleared. It would, it would affect her future, her everything. But God, she was just so thankful for the church. So thank you, church, for praying for her. Thankful to, to the Lord more than anything else for what God was able to do. But no matter what you're facing, if you put it in the hand of God, God will work in ways that you cannot see. God will speak to people that have the decision-making power and influence and all those things. And he will change the heart of man and move things around and bring the right people in. And whatever that looks like, I don't know the deal. I didn't even ask the uh, uh, sister for details because I, it, it really didn't matter to me in that sense. I just know the heart of it, what was going on. But the answer was what mattered, that God did it. That God did it. He won't fail. Sometimes the answers may not always go favorably. But even when the answers go favorably or not the way we want it to, you have to realize that God is still in control. And he will work it all out for good. And that verse that we read, James chapter 1 verse 2 through 4, it says, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So you got trials, you got faith, you got patience, you got perfect work and completion, lacking nothing. A lot of words there, ideas there. And I just wanted to, before I close, I just wanted to dig into that a little bit. You see, the trials that we face in life, the trials don't produce faith, it reveals our faith. Amen? Pay attention there. Trials do not produce faith, it reveals our faith. Wait, what do you mean, Pastor C? Because faith is a gift from God. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing. How does it come? By hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it is a gift from God. So when we have been given the gift of faith and God has given faith to us, it is not because of a trial that produced the faith, but the trials will reveal our faith. And what we have faith in and where we put our faith. Amen? Trials will reveal to us what we trust and who we trust. Adversity will reveal our character. Hey, is it going to, you know, what's going to come out of our head? What's going to come out of our mouth? What's going to come out of our life? When adversity comes, it's going to reveal what's on the inside of us. It's, it's better to be tested and proven than not be tested at all. Trials reveal what faith we do have. So trials don't produce faith. What does it do? It reveals it. But what does it produce? It does produce something. What does it produce? Go to the scripture. Go to the scripture. If you can put that verse up there, guys. James 1, 2 to 4. James 1, 2 to 4. My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, what does it produce? Produces patience. Produces patience. Folks, I want to just sit on that word patience for a moment. How many of you need more patience? All the young people even raising hands? How many of you need patience? Come on. Who's gone shopping in the holiday season? Who went to Costco this weekend? No, but don't go on the weekends, especially if, right. Uh, who needs patience? Who needs patience with your spouse? All the wives raising, no. Who needs patience with your kids if you have any? Who needs patience with your boss? Oh, look at that. Who needs patience with your coworkers? Who needs patience with your, your family? Who needs patience with your church? Everybody should raise your hand. Who needs patience? Who, everybody needs patience. When the Lord called me to ministry, he told me to pray for th three things and just ask for three things. One was wisdom. Second was discernment. Third was patience. Three specific, wisdom, to lead the people, 
discernment to really see what's behind the scene. And third was patience. Be careful what you ask for. If you want patience, it's going to be tested. If you want wisdom, you're going to have some hard situations to go through. If you want discernment, God is going to put some things and people in front of you. You got to see through the t- tangible and the physical and get into the spiritual. So be careful what you ask for. But patience in the Greek is the word hupomone. Hupomone. H U P O M O N E. Hupomone. Someone say hupomone. Hupomone. Patience is that Greek word hupomone. It does not mean a passive waiting like. How many of you, you've waited in the doctor's office? Not a, hey, I'm just going to go browse through my phone. No, it's like an active waiting. It's like, hey, I'm not going to just sit here and wait for the doctor to call me. No, it's me preparing to be something and do something while I'm waiting for that, while I'm waiting for that goal, that I'm working towards it. I'm working towards it. I want to lose 20 pounds. I'm not going to just sit on the couch and uh, twiddle my fingers on the phone and expect 20 pounds to disappear. I'm working towards this. I'm getting in the weight room. I'm getting on the treadmill. I'm doing this. I'm watching what I eat. I'm going to fast and pray during the 21 days of prayer and let that be a head start to my weight loss. Pray first, lose weight second. Right? And you're going to see what happens. You're going to see what happens. If you patiently, actively wait and endure the situations of the hard seasons of life, actively endure through that. That's what patience really means. It's not just, oh, I'm just going to wait around for God to do something. No, when God calls you to do something, take steps towards it. He's called you to ministry, start serving. Pick up a broom and start serving in the church. He's called you to preach, then serve coffee in the cafe. What cafe? Oh, I don't know, I'm just dreaming. Do something. If you want to get on the platform, do something in the hidden places. If you never get on the platform, you're still called by God. Spirit of the living God. Patiently wait. You're waiting for your spouse? Patiently wait. Prepare yourself while you're waiting for your spouse. Don't wait for the perfect man. You make yourself ready and prepared. Don't wait for the perfect woman. You prepare yourself. Hey, when that person comes, will I be ready to take this on? Will I be ready for this, not burden, but responsibility? Will will I be ready to take care of that person? Do I have a job? Do I have means to provide? Do I have this? Do I have my head on straight? Are my goals? Is it for uh, whatever I'm thinking I'm going to get married for? Is it for, hey, I'm committed to getting married regardless of what I go through, what I face, and what we face together. I prepare yourself actively, be patiently, enduring life while you prepare for what God has for you. Patiently wait. But there's also another connotation to that meaning of patience. It means that you're placed under something heavy. You're placed under something heavy. The two, that word hupomone, if you break it down, it says basically you're under something and you remain under that heavy hand. It has the picture of someone under a heavy load and choosing to stay under that. How many of you like to get out of some situations, some pressure situations? We'd like to, but when we are patient with with God and God's patience, we're saying, God, I'm under a heavy pressure right now, but I'm not going to run away. I'm not, I'm going to choose to stay here right under your head, under your hand. And if I'm staying here, abiding in you, patient, actively enduring, I know you have something waiting for me. If I'm waiting for you, God, you're going to wait for me to endure through this. So trials don't produce faith. It reveals your faith. But it does produce patience. So I hope and pray that today that when you remember the hard seasons or whenever you face hard seasons in your life, maybe this is a, a, um, a prophetic word to some. Maybe it's an on-time word for some. Maybe it's just a, a word of testimony for others. But I'm telling you, God is not done producing something because when he does produce it, We become what? Perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Could we get to that place? Oh, wait, you could be perfect? You could be complete? You could be lacking nothing? That's the goal for God. For us to be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. 
As I close here, I just want to encourage you with some scriptures of hope for joy in the hard seasons. Because I know in the gospel of John chapter 15, Jesus said himself to his disciples and even to us today. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you. Whose joy? Whose joy? His joy, the joy of God. That my joy may be in you that, and that your joy may be full. I don't know how many of our joy meters or joy tanks are empty or on the low, but today in the presence of God, God can fill your heart and your life with joy before you leave here today. John chapter 16, verse 22. He said, so with you, now is your time of grief. This is talking about his death. John 16, 22. But I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. Amen? Now is your time of grief. Yes, Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm going to die, and there's going to be a separation, and you're going to be able to grieve. And here's the other thing, folks. When you go through the realities of life and death, when especially those that are grieving the loss of loved ones, I opened with our experience, and many of you... All of us have our own experiences. Whenever you come into those moments, don't run away from it. Embrace it. Grieve. Grieve properly in the presence of God. Now is your time of grief, Jesus is saying. But here's the but. The but I will see you again. And you will rejoice. And no one will take away your joy. Folks, let me tell you another thing. Uh, another thing. Please don't let the enemy take away your joy. Please, please don't, let the, don't let life take away your joy. You hold on to your joy. Hold on. Don't let work take away your joy. Huh? Don't let work take away your joy. Maybe he can take away your happiness, but he cannot take away your joy. Do not let people take away your joy. Do not let life take away your joy. Do not let circumstances take away your joy. Folks, hold on to the joy because Jesus said, no one can take your joy. No one. If it happens, then we allowed it to happen. But Jesus said, no one can take your joy. So you keep rejoicing. And I close with Psalms 30, verse 5. Psalms 30, verse 5. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Whew. I'm thankful that God is a correcting God, a loving God, a merciful God, and also a disciplining God, but it only lasts for a moment. But his favor lasts for a lifetime. I'm, I, I'm, I'm good for a lifetime of favor. Anyone else good for a lifetime of favor? I'm good for a lifetime. God, give me, I'll take a lifetime of favor. If you got to give me a little anger once in a while, but if it gives me lifetime of favor, oh, little obedience, oh, sorry, little discipline is good. Little discipline is good because it's for your lifetime of favor. Not just in the spiritual, but in the natural. A little discipline is good. A little correction is good because there's a greater picture and a greater purpose and a greater potential that's awaiting you. A lifetime, a lifetime of favor is awaiting you. Oh. If I could go back and tell my younger self a lot of things. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Here's the best part, I think. Weeping may stay for the night, but joy comes in the morning. <laughs> Weeping may come for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Can you put that verse up? One more time? Weeping. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night. It may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. Thank you, Lord. I'm, I'm just sensing the Lord tell me to focus on that last part. Weeping may last through the night. It may last through the night. But look at that second part. But joy comes in the morning. Thank you, Lord. Help me. Weeping, it just lasts through the night. Meaning, it could just be for one night. Meaning, it could just be for a few hours. Meaning, it could just be a temporary thing. But joy comes in the morning. Pay attention to that scripture. It, Thank you. Thank you. Joy comes in the morning, meaning there's a morning coming. And a morning will keep coming. If the clock keeps moving and the days keep going, there's another morning coming. There's another morning coming. Monday's coming. Wednesday's coming. 
Thursday is coming. But wait a minute. Weeping just lasted through one night. Sunday night I wept for a few hours. But joy comes on Monday morning. Joy comes on Tuesday morning. Joy comes on Friday morning. Joy comes on Saturday morning. My weeping stayed there on Sunday night. It stayed there. But joy, joy, joy keeps coming back. Keeps coming back. Keeps co- I want to tell somebody, yes, you can weep and you can cry and you can go through a hard season, but let it just last for a night. Let it just stay right where it needs to stay. And let you and I be empowered by the Holy Spirit to say, God, keep me going to get to the morning. Keep me going to get to the next day because joy is awaiting me. Joy is awaiting Oh, man, if I get out of the bed, I'm joyful. I got a reason to get, be joyful because I got out of the bed. I got out of my, in my mornings. I stood up in my life and I said, hey, this is what the Lord is going to help me to do. This is what God has called me to be. This is what God is going to strengthen me to do today. Joy comes in the morning. Thank you, Lord, for joy that comes in the morning. Come on, give God a shout of praise. So I close with that verse, but with this question. Do we desire the hard seasons? Do we desire the trials of life? What if we did? If we did, we would feel the strength of God. We would experience the power of our faith in God. We would be able to lean on the everlasting arms of God and hold on to his everlasting arms. And we would be able to see God at work. Thanks for joining us this week on the One Church Podcast. Be sure to tune in next week. If you are ready to start a relationship with Jesus, to make Him the Lord of your life, and receive salvation, please contact us at info at onechurchonline.com. We hope you found value in this podcast, and we'd appreciate you sharing us with others and telling your friends and family to follow along with us. Our prayer and hope is that this podcast can reach countless lives. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Subscribe to our YouTube and Spotify at One Church LI. And visit us at our website, onechurchonline.com. Here at One Church, our vision is to see Jesus. We exist to reach the one with the love of Jesus and for all to live like Jesus. We want to see Jesus in each other and we pray and believe there is more for you.